Hello. Now then, who remembers this? And this. And this. And certainly this. That was quite a hard shot to get that. You had to be very precise. It was, yes. <laughs> well, Goldeneye was one of our favourite ever games. And here I have. Uh, Man 64, you bought this for me. Christmas. 1997. That's and it. we played this game forever, didn't we? Lots and lots of play on this. There's the original cartridge. That cartridge didn't come out of that slot I, until Ocarina of Time, and that's a different story. But yes. It's, uh, that stayed in there, welded in, for quite some time. GoldenEye N64 came out 25 years ago this year. And it just blew us away on so many levels. It had great action, great graphics, sound and music, and it actually made you feel like you were James Bond 007. Even though it was actually a pretty big game, once completed, it also had incredible replay value. You could go back over and over again, unlocking more weapons, a couple of amazing hidden levels, but also loads of funny little things and additions that showed that the development team were having quite a bit of fun with it by adding things like big head mode and also being able to increase enemy damage to a point where you could see your enemies literally dance on screen. <laughs> Some of those hidden levels, you had Aztec, Aztec. I seem to remember. Was that where we saw Jaws? Was Jaws in yeah, there? there was a yeah. Moon, yeah, Moonraker. Moonraker. Moonraker, yes. With Roger Moore. Yes. A little premature, isn't it? <laughs> we interviewed Roger Moore, absolutely wonderful man, lovely, lovely man. Um, so yeah, that was... Very really, funny, actually. Yeah, very funny. Very funny. Um, but I'm just thinking of some of the levels in... Uh, in Egyptian in, yeah. facility. But we always played facility, didn't we? We absolutely loved that. I used to like quite going outside on the surface and running around in the... In the snow, that was always quite nice. I, think I used to don't know why I'm doing that. I used to complete the level um, facility and then before finishing it, shooting the gas. So it just gassed everybody yeah. in the whole yeah. bunker anyway. Yeah. Sorry, it was a great game, yeah. That um, we used to play a lot, didn't we? Yeah, absolutely brilliant. Do you remember one of your favourite places to hide? My my favourite place to hide when we were doing multiplayer was in the toilets. Above the toilet, I would hide up in the duct. Is it the duct? Is that what you call it? Could you get up there in the multiplayer? I thought you could. It's ages since I've played the multiplayer. Could you not get up there? Am I wrong? I used to like hiding in the toilets anyway. Multiplayer this weekend, yes. right? I need to, I need to fire that up again and um, and try and remember if you can get up into the toilets. Can you get toilets. into there? I don't know. Maybe it was just hanging out in toilets. Do you see the things that occupy our minds in between <laughs> editing and doing other bits and yes. pieces? It's, well, uh, there you are. When making From Bedrooms to Billions, we were lucky enough to get an interview with GoldenEye N64 director Martin Hollis and fellow GoldenEye developer David Doak. In what were two mammoth interviews, as well as everything else, we of course covered Goldeneye. I remember when I first met David Doak, um, I think I said proudly to him, do you know how many times I've killed you? And I think he sort of looked at me uh, with that sort of look of like, mm, I've heard that a few times before. Um, it was a fantastic couple of interviews that we did and we actually got them to sign our own copy of Goldeneye N64, which we're really, really proud of because it's such, a, such an amazing game. The edit you're about to see comes from a much longer edit that we created a, a couple of years back because it's always been it's always been our hope to sort of do a more complete GoldenEye making of and get some of the original team back together, isn't it? Yeah, maybe do like a dedicated film or episode on the development of um, GoldenEye in 64 um, and we'd love to get the original team together. So hopefully one day we can make that happen. I hope so. Yes, It'll be good, that wouldn't would it? be nice, yes. So we, we prepared this this we've taken a, a section from that much longer edit and made it into sort of a self-contained sort of 10 minute version to just sort of give you a feel of um of a little bit of an overview of Goldeneye because it is the 25th anniversary of the game not today but it is uh, it is actually this oh, year there's lots of anniversaries this year there's a lot there is a lot happening so yeah. um but anyway for now we will hand you over to martin hollis and the very real david and, doak and actual dr david doak yes, that is to learn a little more about the fantastic golden eye n64 thank you bye 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 there
The first I really heard of Goldeneye as a thing was when it was Bond 18. I heard the Donkey Kong Country team had gone over to the PR event. They got to meet all the stars, they got to meet Piers Brosnan, and it was a big PR event to promote. There's a new Bond film, everyone should be excited about a new Bond film. But the guys from Rare went with a view that perhaps they would be doing a game. They came back and Greg Mayles, um, I heard, had said well, he, he wasn't very impressed by the script and, um, and so on. So that was basically a no from the Donkey Kong Country team. I heard this rumour on the grapevine at Rare. So I went to Tim Stanford and I said, well, I, I wouldn't mind doing a GoldenEye game if that would be interesting. And he said, yeah, yeah, OK. You better do a game sign document. So I was like, oh, OK then put together about 10 pages in the word processor on the SGIs and um, that was the design document for Goldeneye and then it was my team and my project for I think two and three quarter years. In the beginning when I wrote the document we didn't have hardware, we didn't know exactly what the hardware was, we didn't know it was going to have four sockets on the front of the Nintendo 64, we didn't know it was going to have an analogue stick. So you have to be massively adaptive. But having said that, I did pretty well with the design doc. It said something like, perhaps we can have two N64s joined together so you can play two-player competitive. Perhaps we can have bullet holes on the walls and perhaps we can have AI so other people can wander around. So at that point, the design doc is carefully vague about exactly what the control system will be. It's difficult to plan a control system if you don't know what the input is. And it was carefully vague about what the viewpoint would be. I always wanted it to be first person, and the main reference was Virtual Cop. Help me! Help me. At the same time, in that document, it did say that you could have autonomy to go around the levels. The enemies would have AI, they'd be able to navigate the levels and that kind of thing. Looking at the levels, I listed them all out in the document, about 18, you know, it's like not bad. Statue Park it had a little question mark beside it. <laughs> it's like, well, Statue Park, it's kind of okay in the game, I guess. It sort of worked out, it's a bit, it's a bit of a grey area, Statue <laughs> Park. So, uh, you know, I, I feel okay looking over that old document. <laughs> I did all right. Duncan Botwood was the designer on before I mean, we, we worked together on it. Um, I mean, Duncan had specked out things that would ha maybe happen in the levels but the act of design was completely organic and iterative. I mean, it was like, you sit down, stick a bunch of stuff in, play it, well, it doesn't work. Make it a bit better, you know, just over and over and over again. Um, and, and, and trying to please yourself, really. And, you know, and, and whatever humour and stuff was put in, was put in to kind of, you know, to please the team. It seems incredible that something that was so high profile in the end and important and successful, you know, there weren't very many games out on the N64, you know, that was a, a significant part of Nintendo's investment in the platform. And we were in that strange kind of second party relationship with them. People didn't check what we were doing. You know, we were generally left to our own devices. And when they did check, it was, you know, it's coming along well or well, can you do it quicker? Because I mean, people massively underestimated the scope. Um, yeah, I think Martin and Mark probably spent you know, the first year rolling their own 3D engine because you, there was no off-the-shelf stuff. It was all being built from scratch. And all of the pipeline was built from scratch for importing the geometry and all that kind of stuff. So it was, it was, you know, it was real kind of like moon mission kind of stuff, you know. You, know, you, you won't be landing on the moon and showing the pictures to everyone until you've gone through all of the all of the steps that kind of bootstrap you up to there. None of us have done a 3D game, so the GoldenEye team. I always say it's about 10 or 11 people, and my picture is the corridor 
you know, that the team that we all sat in about to a room. And, out, you know, out of those 10, 11 people, um, I'd made games before from my hobbyist days and Killer Instinct. And Adrian Smith had done art on a couple of games, at least. But the other eight of them had never made a game. It was an interesting role at Rare because Rare was quite compartmentalised with the teams. So there was like the Donkey Kong people, there was the people doing N64 stuff, or Ultra, as it was called at the time. Um, because I was the guy who, one of the guys who fixed your machines, I had access all areas because you had to go and sit at somebody's desk. So I knew what was going on. And I'd been doing it probably for about six months. And just it began to be something I didn't like doing anymore because I was saying earlier, it was, it, was, it was a bit like being in Willy Wonka's Chocolate Factory, but being behind a piece of glass, so you weren't involved. You know, you, you got to change the fuses or something. And I was looking to leave. Um, a friend mistakenly faxed me some job application thing to Rare, so I got called in. You're thinking of leaving? Well, yeah, I am. Um, and then Martin came forward and said, no, we don't have him come on the GoldenEye team. Um, he can probably learn to code, but I think he's got, he can help out. So I, I, it's funny, I, for a while I was technically a programmer. I'm not a great programmer. Um, and then that evolved within the team into a design role that became a more important design role. Um, and then with Martin and Mark Edmonds, I mean, I was kind of like, they, they would be writing the code. I would be using stuff that they'd written to do design work and then coming back to them saying, you know, really, if we could do this, then I could do these other things. Okay, well, that's worthwhile. And it's kind of springboarded from there. None of us had ever made a game in 3D. None of us had ever made a shooting game. None of, it just goes on the list, really. None, I'd never managed a team. <laughs> um, I'd gone from being third program on Killer Instinct to being the boss of my own team. Interesting times. Um, so, yeah, we just t totally just made it up every day as you went along. You know, we didn't have, in the beginning, we didn't have source control. Rare didn't have any backups. They had like 30 staff with computers with no backups. So yeah, there's a system administration facet to my work there. Together with Dave, we set up DAT tapes and all that kind of thing. I had them network all the computers together, encouraging everyone to use email. That was a new thing. That was one facet. But then the GoldenEye project itself, my goodness me. <laughs> to realise the vision that was encapsulated largely in that design document and to realise the ambition of the team, um, it did take two and three quarter years of incredibly hard work. Um, it's not like we were slacking off. We were not slacking off. We were working very hard and the amount, the amount of talent on that team was astonishing. There was no, there was no dead weight and there was, there was nobody who I wouldn't be delighted to work with again. Um, and you know, we had every reason to apply ourselves. We knew it was a special time. We knew we were lucky to have all this kit. To, you know, and we knew that we were unique. Most teams weren't 10 people teams. That gives you a huge leg up. Most teams, you don't have the funding. You know, they, they must have spent, they must have spent 300,000 pounds on machines for the team. Software could have been equal. In the end, I heard the budget for the whole project, including payroll and hardware. Motion capture we did, it's an expensive old business. Two million dollar budget grossed 400 million, so <laughs> it's all right. <laughs> <laughs>